Welcome to Stepdad Success, turning the tide on the way stepdads are seen and show up in the world. We're a new breed of leaders raising leaders. Blood or no blood, we raise them as our own. We're connected, loving, and committed to leading them into the future. If you asked a normal dad, he'd say we're doing the impossible. He'd say, but they're not yours. How do you do it? Yet every day, stepdads around the world are forging the way. That's what we call stepdad success. We're leaders raising leaders. And these are our stories. Okay, James Klobasa here from Stepdad Success. And today we've got another interview. And today's interview is with a guy by the name of Matt Roth. And he's out of Rochester, New York. Now, I'm not exactly familiar with where that is on the map, but I hear it's upstate. So I have heard of that before. Uh, Matt is a sales director in the in the medical field and has a background of college football, uh, playing semi-pro in Ohio um, earlier in his years. He's also married and he's got two stepkids. It's Elliot, 12 years old, and Helena, which is nine years old. Very similar to my two boys at eight and ten. So I'm looking forward to having this discussion. Um, welcome, Matt. Are you there? Can you hear us? Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Awesome, buddy. Awesome. So, mate, I'll dive straight in and put you on the spot just to just to update us and give us a little bit of background on kind of your story, and and then we can you know we can dive in further from there. You told us you're from upstate New York, and background. I'm kind of interested in the college football background, and kind of how that ties into everything as well. And I know you've got a, you know, you gave me a little bit of information on, you know, your kind of upbringing and that sort of thing. We can dive into that a little bit more if you'd like. But um, just give us a little bit of background on yourself so the listeners can have an idea of kind of where you've come from, who you are, that sort of thing. Certainly. Um, For starters, um, I grew up with a stepfather as well. Uh, My parents were divorced before I was born. Uh, about a month before I was born, and my mother remarried when I was six, approaching seven years old. So I know I know good and well that you know the, the, the job of a stepfather it can be a thankless one, um, and it also uh, a really uh, an experience that is, is life changing. Um, I grew up in Ohio, and I was a little bit of a lost soul. Um, due to my parents' divorce and me never really having a solid father figure in my life, I I drifted and was uh, was kind of portrayed as the outcast. I was a bad reminder of my mother's failed marriage. They were both very young, and I am the spinning image of my father, so every day she had to look at me, I think it was a painful reminder of a uh, love that was lost and a relationship that had been fractured. So uh, I had some... I had some difficulty growing up, um, feeling a little bit alienated. I felt like the stepchild, even with my own mother. Um, I wasn't a very strong student, so I spent a lot of my time in athletics and hanging out with friends. Um, Football was my passion. Um, Unfortunately, I I wasn't uh, big and and fast enough at the time to really uh, get some decent college offers, so I went to a, a Division II school. And because my scholastic uh, aptitude wasn't in place and, you know, I'm finding out now I had a lot of residual anger over my childhood, I got myself into some trouble. I only made it through a year through my college football profession and uh, still not still not ready to commit to uh, developing into a man and, and what sort of uh, lifestyle I wanted to lead. I, I got myself involved with some semi-pro football which uh, sounds glamorous, but it is not. It is, it is a league full of guys that didn't make it, guys that weren't big enough or strong enough or fast enough or had gotten themselves into trouble to kind of explore, and you're always hopeful to get looked at. And that lasted about two more years. And by then I had to kind of settle down and develop a, develop a career for myself. So well, I guess we'll pause from there, and if you could leave me another question, I'll uh, I'll keep going. My my life is an open book for you. Yeah, no problem at all. It's interesting, I, and I wanted to kind of pick up on um, just the fact that you'd been brought up by a step parent as well as 
you know, you now um, being a step parent, that, that's an interesting kind of angle on it because, uh, you know, a lot of people, like step parenting kind of is very common nowadays. Um, but years ago, it probably wasn't as common um, as, as what it is today. But maybe if you could just tell me, you know, what was your upbringing like you know, with your, your stepdad? Um, and then we can kind of transfer into, you know, you being a stepdad now. You know, what was that okay. an initial kind of, what was the relationship like with your, um, you know, your stepdad and how did that kind of transfer into what you're doing now? Well, circling back on something that you hit on, back in the day, it wasn't readily accessible. You know, it wasn't accepted. Um, sure, yeah. Um, my stepfather's parents were dead against him adopting me just because they were uh, they were strict, devout Catholics. And at that point in time, it wasn't accepted. Divorce wasn't accepted. So I wasn't allowed to call them grandma and grandpa for, well, that was until my sister was born and she could talk because they didn't want there to be any confusion, having one address them as a certain name and, and me having to address them as Mr. and Mrs. Roth. So it was uh, it was definitely frowned upon back then. Um, wow, yeah. Yeah, totally a different yeah. time. Um, totally a different time. Uh, how does that, you know, how do you feel about step parenting? I know you're, you know, you're a step parent now and uh, I'm sure you're very loving to your kids and that sort of thing, but how's that, you know, you're growing up from that, you kind of have a, a different perspective on what it is now. How do you think that's shifted for you? It's definitely set the groundwork for what I want for the kids in my life right now. Um, the relationship that I have with my stepfather, it started off as a great friendship, especially the adoption process. Um, he liked to play outside, um, exposed me to the sports that he knew. And, you know, not knowing what having, and this is going to sound funny to people, but not knowing what having a flesh and blood father feels like in your life. I just thought that the relationship we had was normal. And I can tell you, I don't believe there was ever any hugging. Um, I don't think he ever told me that he loved me. And, you know, looking back on it now, I think I was, I was kind of a missing piece. And I'm going to take a step sideways just to elaborate on what I just shared with you. Sure. Um, through the miracle of, through the miracle of Facebook, um, about four and a half years ago, I was approached by a sister that I have that I had never met before. And to make a long story short, and if you'd like to ask questions after we get down this pathway, you certainly can. But she, in a nutshell, introduced herself as my sister and that I had three or four other siblings that were living in Denver, Colorado, and my dad was out there as well, and they had been looking for me for a good 13 years. So wow. moving fast forward, I've established ties with my dad. And kind of building on that connection that a father and son has, he is my best friend. And he was a horrible man back in the day. Um, he was involved with the Irish mob in Cleveland, Ohio. And one of the reasons why he left was he wanted to explore the 70s and the hippie lifestyle. And he got connected with the wrong guys, and it just it pulled him away. But, uh, you know, getting to know him now and establishing ties and seeing the similarities, even though we've never really had contact, um, we have the same mannerisms, the same looks, the same interests. We both play the drums. We're both very interested in the American Civil War. Um, same temper. It's 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 really it's really crazy how powerful DNA is. Having no exposure to this man before, I'm more like him than any of his other five kids. So oh, yeah. connecting with him was extremely powerful for me to be able to look at, well, okay, well, this is why I am who I am. And this is why I like the things that I do. And I think that kind of gets lost in translation. And you don't really have a reason to look for it in, until it's there and you experience it. So it was overwhelming to have my actual biological father be a part of my life. And he actually 
just came to visit me about two weeks ago and spent the entire week here, and it was just an awesome time. Wow, that's fantastic. Tell me, <laughs> you know, um, there are obviously, you know, reasons for you, um, you know, being kind of separated from your, your your dad when he was younger and that sort of thing. Now that he's back in your life, is he connected with your stepdad and do they get along? Is there, you know, has that relationship and how does it all kind of tie in? Well, it doesn't. And the upbringing that I didn't elaborate too much on, it was not only was I an outcast, there was a lot of abuse that was handed down. So I'll answer any questions there, but to answer your first question, um, I separated and broke ties with my mom and my stepdad and my stepsister approximately nine years ago due to the fact that it was uh, it was kind of the definition of insanity. I was beating my head against the wall trying to repair something and experiencing the same disappointments and the same results over and over again to the point where it was it was just easier to move on without them versus to be continually disappointed around the holidays, not having that relationship, not having that rapport. So I, I just kind of uh, pushed off on my own. Yeah. I, and just to kind of empathize with you there, Matt, like I grew up in a rough household and, you know, me and my actual biological dad don't really get along because of similar reasons, a lot of abuse, a lot of, you know, mental and physical and, um, we and I too tried to repair those ties and did my best, you know. And going down that whole path of becoming, you know, a professional sports person and successful in business, all tr- all trying to, you know, mend that way and show them that I was okay and prove that I was good enough. Um, I fully understand that. Um, it's a it's a tough road to go down, and then. Um, you know, I know for myself, it's it's tough to have that tie severed. Um, you know, is it the same? I'm sure it is kind of the same for you, but are you feeling that, you know, at some stage you just have to let go and carry on? It was difficult. It, it certainly was, but I agree with you 100%. You can't keep going to the well and trying to pull some water out and not get anything. It was just, it was disappointing and... It was it was the right thing to do, and I have absolutely no regrets. Mm. Um, okay, so I mean that's a lot of your background there, and I totally you know uh, it's it's interesting to hear. You know, I haven't had um, anyone on the podcast to date that has come from a, a step parenting background like yourself. How's that translate into your to your new? relationships like maybe you can just start off kick it off with you know how you met your wife and how old the kids were and that sort of stuff certainly so to address your first question it's given me the perfect template to do the exact opposite um so i met my wife approximately six years ago and i was at a point in my life where i didn't think i was going to get remarried i'd been divorced i'd had a lot of unsuccessful relationships take place. So I signed up for Match.com. And we met there, and there was instant chemistry. Um, My wife, her name is Kara. Um, She had gone through her divorce about two years prior, had had one relationship after that. It had had failed in the meantime. Um, Her divorce, um, loss of job, um, had to file bankruptcy. When I met her, she was living back with her parents, um, working two jobs, trying to raise two kids. Um, they have shared custody, so she was able to do her work at Syracuse University as an adjunct professor and also maintained a director of marketing position at a local firm here to, uh, to kind of work off of her debts. So when we first met, I really, I never would have picked up on all of the struggle that she was having. And she was very, very guarded on bringing me around the shoulder naturally, not knowing how our relationship would work out and we started dating. So it was about three months before I met the kids. And it timed out that we met on Christmas Eve. I was home alone 
and she was heartbroken to know that I didn't have any connections with family locally and didn't want me to be alone on Christmas, so I was invited over to the family gathering. And I would say it may have been five minutes before I had Elliot on my left leg and Helena on my right leg, and I was walking like Frankenstein all around the house, dragging them behind me. So we had an instant connection. I think they were starving for some uh, some male companionship, some 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 sort of role model that I don't think they were getting from their dad. They were very very uh, they were very needy, very needy kids. And um, how they, how old were they? Yeah. How old were they at that time, Matt? Um, five and met? three. Five and yeah, three. five and three. Yeah, it's it's. Both, gr- both yeah, it's gr- be- yeah, I was just going to say it's a great it's a great age and it's it's interesting. You know, I met um, Trey and Indy when they're eighteen months and three years, and um, it's still at that very early age where bonding is is a totally different kind of conversation compared to you know bonding with teenagers and stuff. So it's a nice age. Yeah, agreed. Um, it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't smooth sailing. Um, Kara's father is a retired minister, and he is on we'll, we'll call it quote unquote disability. Um, he is, was diagnosed with PTSD, and that was due to his exposures in the ministry of having to administer last right, visiting sick people in the hospital. He just had a mental breakdown. So. We met in, we were, I met the kids in December. In February, my wife called crying, saying that her father could not handle the stress and the noise in the house anymore, and they were living in the basement, and yeah. that he wanted them to move. Um, so we all kind of put our heads together, and I said that you, you, can't, you can't keep moving these kids around, and I owned my own home at the time. And recognizing that it, it may jeopardize our relationship, I didn't want them to have to move into, you know, an apartment. I invited them to move in with me, and that was the start of it all. Sure. It was a pretty crazy time. <laughs> I can imagine. I know that feeling of much in much the same way. It's um, you know, that first initial bringing everyone together can be. I mean, it's a it's a great time, but it can be, you know, it's challenging. And you know, for me, uh, not having kids, you know, not having biological kids of my own, all of a sudden having two kids in the house, you know, from a quiet house to a very rowdy house, it's a it's an interesting time, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and rowdy was an understatement. Um, <laughs> these two these two were wild Indians. Um, because Kara was working two jobs, by the time that she got home and was able to be a mom, she was completely wiped out. So there was rarely any discipline administered because she just wanted the time that she had with the kids to be peaceful. So we had to do a lot of adjusting um, yeah. with some some behavioral issues. Um, both kids had some deep-seated anger issues for the things that they had experienced in their short times. Um, you know, Elliot remembers the divorce. He remembers the house that he lived in with, you know, with his dad. And they both were a little bit crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, and like, I understand that too, because we obviously been through that situation and, um, you know, forming that bond so that you're able to do the parenting that's needed. You know, how is your connection with the kids first initially and, and then now? Initially, I'll be honest, I struggled with them. Um, and they'll sound terrible, but my role model up until my, my mom remarried was my grandfather. And I lived with both my grandparents. So in my formative years, those were my parents. And I'm an old school guy. So a lot of the parenting style that I have, I get from my grandfather. He was a no-nonsense guy. Respect, discipline, kindness, all those things are very, very important. 
and those were things they hadn't been exposed to. Elliot was extremely emotionally unstable, would cry at the drop of a hat, um, was angry at the drop of a hat, and he had uh, he had some learning disabilities in school. So we had a struggle there. Helena was extremely headstrong. Um, she would be known to have violent tantrums. So in the store, she would bite, kick if she was being carried and wanted something that she wasn't getting. Um, there were times where she physically hurt my wife because she just couldn't contain the fury that, that Helena was uh, displaying. So at, at the start, it was it was rough. Um, I'm, I'm looking back at it now and looking where we are today, and it is a complete 180 degree turnaround. Sure, so, sure. And what's it what's it like today? What's the, the connection like and that sort of thing? Today, the connection is amazing, and. <laughs> We're under a lot of stress right now, and last night I looked at Elliot and I at bedtime after having a strong discussion with him on if he was committed on something or if he was interested on something, he was being a little bit lazy. And it was a tough conversation, and he got it, and he respected it. And I walked out of the room, and I closed the door, and I went back in, and I said, I forgot to tell you something. I told him that your blood does not run, my blood does not run through your veins. But I love you like it does. And I will yeah. always love you just like that, no matter what you do. There's nothing that you can do to ever take that love away. I will always be in your corner. I'll always have your back. Elliot wears his hair like I do. Elliot likes my sports teams. Elliot plays the sports that I play. Elliot plays drums. Elliot has my interests. Elliot wants to do what I do. Mm, it's a hope. It's a, it's a, it's a magical thing when that starts to when that happens isn't it when it's when they start to like what you like and i mean as i said i I don't have biological kids but um even in che and indy you know i i love to get up and run on the beach in the morning and and i love to hit the ocean and swim and you know the little guy che he's like james can you know can you wake me up at 5 a.m so we can run on the beach you know, you're like, it's like, dude, like you don't need to wake up that early. I do it because I, you know, I want to do it. I've got stuff to do. You don't need to get up that early. No, 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 no. Wake me up. Wake me up. Wake me up. It's a, it's a magical thing, isn't it? When they start to really take an interest and, and kind of, I guess, mimic in their own way. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's a great share. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Helena and I are two peas in a pod. Um, She's nine going on 10. She's, um, she's trying to stretch and grow and be older than she is. And at the same time, she'll, she'll still come and sit on my lap or on the couch or in a reclining chair. And she'll come over out of the blue and just give me a kiss and tell me that she loves me. And it just, it, it, it warms my heart every time. You know, we, we walked into a restaurant last night. She grabbed my hand, held my hand the whole way through. It's just, it's magical. It, it truly is. Yeah. Yeah. Those moments, it's, um, you know, you think about all the struggles and, you know, tr- trying times and the, they kind of melt your heart. And as you said, you know, blood or no blood, um, they still melt your heart in the same way. Mm-hmm. Tell me, what do you think was the big shift? You know, you said it was a bit bit of a struggle earlier, and I've experienced the same thing too. What was the shift for you compared to now, when it's it's you know it's really tight, and they, you know, as I said, they, you know, they're mimicking you, they're 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 wanting to be around you, they openly show affection. Um, what do you think that that shift was, and and how you know if there was anything that you think you've done to create that? I know exactly when the shift took place. Um, we were approximately a year in, and I had made mention of behavioral issues, and there was a fear on my wife's part to discipline, and it got to the point where she became frustrated with the shenanigans going on in the house, and I pulled her aside and took her hand, and I said, you have to give this part to me. 
you don't want to do it, and I understand that, and I respect you for it. You want to be the mom. You want to be the nurturer. I get it. But there has to be some structure. There has to be some discipline. There has to be some guidance. We have to set them on a path for success. You have to give that peace to me. Let me do it. Trust me. I I will have the kid's best interests at all times. But when she was able to give that peace up and trust that I would deliver on my commitments, things started to change. Um, Elliot was struggling in school to where he needed tutors in, in three of his classes. And um, I can tell you today, he is a high honor roll student. Um, he's, I think, maybe in the top 10 in his scholastic efforts. Um, we still have some emotional stuff, but it's okay because he's dialed in to where he has an incredible amount of empathy and he's dialed in to people's emotions more so than some of my adult friends are. So I think he's developing into a fine young man. He's an outstanding citizen. Um, I trust him with the house when I'm gone. He's the man of the house. He is responsible. Um, I, I can't say enough good stuff about this guy. He's just incredibly impressive. Yeah. It's amazing how, you know, we pass that on and, you know, I actually posted about this yesterday that, you know, all the struggles of my upbringing and the the abuse, the the, the hardship, the roughness of all of that gave me the softness and the and the skill and the knowledge to be able to pass that down. And it's, you know, when you start to see it in your kids that they, they're becoming like, it's like we're, and this is, you know, part of the reason for this whole podcast is we are in control of shifting the next generation. And I agree with you 100%. And, you know, when you see that, when you see that start to happen, it's, it, you know, it's a, you know, you kind of understand why you go through all the roughness and you understand about your upbringing and what a, really what a gift that was so that you are able to change something for the future. Um, rather than just replay those same old patterns and become another statistic or another, you know, another story for someone to tell in, you know, as they grow up. Yeah. I, I found myself speaking with my wife and my dad and especially with my father reflecting on the hardships that I was exposed to that he wasn't aware of. It was, it was quite upsetting to him and all I can do is reflect on the fact that from a, a cosmic point of view, everything that happens happens the way it's supposed to. It happens for a reason. And it's it's really indicative on on us to see if, if we if our eyes are open for the lesson. So everything that I experienced as a child, all those trials and tribulations have put me in a position to where I can make that shift. I can pass my experiences and my knowledge onto the children. I have a template of what I should not do. Um, inflicting guilt and fear into their lives is something that I, I, I'm very, very guarded on doing. I, I, if, if it creeps in, I will instantly apologize for my behavior and, and I know exactly where it comes from. But I, I think it, you know, at 47 years old, it's sad to say I'm finally finding my purpose and everything is coming together and I'm supposed to be here and I'm supposed to be in these kids' lives and I'm providing things that either their father is unwilling or he is unable to provide for them when it comes to emotional support and love and guidance. And it's really enriching my life to know that I have a role and my purpose has finally been revealed to me. It's not about making money. It isn't the friends. It's about forming their lives and making sure that they have every advantage that I never had. Um, and I'm really proud of that. Mm. Um, I feel 100% the same way. And it's, you know, it's the reason I've started this podcast and the whole discussion around this because, um, you know, I feel so strongly about that myself. You know, I'm 46. I'm much the same. It's like this is, you know, like I can make money anytime. I can, 
I've played sport at you know national level and represented my country. I don't like that's not making that's not who I am. Who I am is what I pass on, and I think you've you've explained that beautifully. It's um you know and I thank you for sharing it. It's it's kind of the driving force behind everything you know we're doing here and even this conversation here today. Um, so it's yeah, it's exactly how I feel. Tell me, Matt. Um, you know, just shifting gears a little bit, is you know, are the the kids dad in their in their life? Like, is the kids dad in their life now? And how's that relationship? You know, how's the relationship between you guys and between the kids? And and how does that all operate? Um, he is in their lives. We live in the same town. They're literally ten minutes away. Um, I would say that their relationship is starting to reveal weak points. And some of the reasons that my wife divorced this man are starting to show up uh, in his parenting styles. So for an, for an example, when we're here as a family, we eat together as a family. In the evening, we spend our time together. The four of us are in the room if they're not off doing activities and if I'm not on the road. We work as a unit. We interact as a unit. When they're over at their father's house, he has remarried, and he has a 16-year-old stepson and a 2-year-old baby, and the kids spend their evenings by themselves or together in their rooms um, with electronics. Um, they're starting to see his shortcomings and they're getting to an age where they're angry about it and they're starting to open up and share. Um, prime example, Elliot's birthday is in April and he was promised a sleepover with two or three of his friends and it hasn't taken place yet. And he's been given excuses and he's been told lies. And I think when they were younger, it was easy to sell these kids these mistruths just to appease them and, you know, kind of get himself out of having to have some responsibility or maybe do some work to, to make these guys happy. Um, they're frustrated. Um, here in the States, these kids have the ability to choose where they want to live at the age of 13. And there's nothing that either parent really can do if they have an you know, attorney appointed for them. And I, I, I feel that this guy doesn't elevate his game and start presenting himself as their father. We're going to probably end up going down that road. He disappoints them constantly. Mm. His solution for love is to try and buy them things. But it, you know, as you know, our, our most precious commodity is time, and he isn't willing to give that to them. And he has a pretty basic nine-to-five job, so we can't even say that he's a busy man and he's traveling. And, you know, there's there's really no excuse for it other than either he's not interested or it's just laziness. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And, and probably, you know, it's not when certainly not judging him as a fact, but that's, you know, that's probably part of his upbringing as well. And, you know, it's a, it's a challenge that a lot of, um, a lot of families have that it's kind of the norm and that's that sedation that's been passed down through generations of, you know, the kids are, the kids will be fine, you know, give them their toys and away they go. It doesn't matter whether the, you know, the toys have changed in this day and age to what they used to be, but it's the same mentality of, you know, the, the kids are almost a, a burden and, you know, they're there to wash the dishes and, you know, but you're exactly right there where time is the most precious commodity that we have and we have that to share. And, you know, I'm sure you're probably much the same as me in the fact that, you know, I have made a conscious effort to spend time one-on-one -on -one with both the boys and spend quality time, not just kind of, you know, me doing one thing and them doing another. It's connected time. And I think that's, as you say, a precious commodity in this day and age and something that a lot of people are still overlooking. Agreed. Um, are you, do you, 
and I know you know you're kind of involved with the, the Warrior Brotherhood as me as I am. Um, a few of the guys I've had on here uh, are involved, but we haven't gone down that road of talking much about the Warrior um, kind of the science of Warrior and the daily actions and that sort of thing. I know you would be implementing some of those. Um, and maybe if, if you can talk about a little bit about that, if you like, and just how you implement, you know, some of those actions during your week. Um, sure. I, I think I've actually, it, 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 it started to just come out of me. Um, I, I, I listen to so much content that you absorb it without even being aware. So the buzzword in the house this week is committed or interested. Now, are you committed in getting a new puppy and helping out with that responsibility, or are you just interested? Um, Warrior's been a, a, a life-changing um, a life-changing organization for me. There's, there's no doubt. Um, the leadership uh, that is exhibited um, through the podcast, through the live uh, the live webcasts, um, it's it's part of my everyday being, and it, it's it's kind of how I'm leading these guys these days. It's you, know, you break it down into small pieces, but a lot of the principles on going after what you want, um, not being afraid to work, not being afraid to sweat, um, work you know just work for what you want, believing in yourself. Um, you know, it's. It, it, <sighs> I'm smiling right now because I'm reflecting on the transformation that I've made as a man through Warrior and how it's affecting the entire family right now. I mean, the, the kids are thriving. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for, for being able to, to find that and, uh, and to share that with the family. They, they've all been very, very good in the time-consuming content that, that takes place initially. But, you know, I, I hear them using some of the phrases that I'm putting on them with their friends now. So it's, it's, it's been extremely positive and it's, it's really affected all of our lives. There's been a tremendous amount of change. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I mean, at the start of these podcasts, I've introduced the, the warrior kind of methodology or the art and what I call the art and the science behind warrior and some of the actions that we're taking on a daily, on a daily basis to, to build those relationships across the board, you know, like across all areas of life. And I think it's a, you know, the the kind of the concept of being a, a one-dimensional man, you know, being great at just business or just fitness or just family versus being a four-dimensional man and being great, you know, at your fitness, at your, your, your religion and spiritual side and business and family. It's a, it's a, it's a new concept for a lot of people, as I said, that we've been passed down this legacy of laziness and legacy of you know, sedation and running you know, the family life as the old way, whereas the, the man's off to work and the, the woman takes care of the house and the, and the kids have got to be out of sight, out of mind. And you know, that whole um, old teaching really does need to change. And... Um, Warrior does a great job, and the concepts of Warrior do a great job of starting that transition. And as you know, I've experienced it myself, um, and so have a lot of the other guys. It's um, it really is nice to see it come together. And just in what you've been saying today, I can tell that you know it's it's making a big difference in your in your actual family life and the connection you have um, with your kids and that sort of thing. What do you think's been the biggest factor in all of that. I mean, and I just want to talk about sort of from the family side of things, like what do you think has been the big tipping point um, for you and your family and what's what's happening? Do you mean in general or due to well, something I was exposed uh, in through Warrior? Well, I just wanted to kind of say, you know, what's the specific thing that you found has had been the biggest leverage point with it across your your family? You know, what uh, something that you an action that you're taking that is the biggest leverage point? Um, I think that the biggest shift that I experienced 
and allow me to take a step backwards to move forward with you. Um, I'm a very competitive guy. And you asked me before, I didn't answer the question about how I got along with their father. First and foremost, I didn't like him off of the bat just because of who he was and who he represented. This was a man that used to share a bed with the woman that I loved. And he was a bit immature on my part. Um, and I've, I've had to do some, some, some expanding in my own, in my own way to get over some of those things, but that's, that's kind of how things were at the start. And looking at these kids, I had a rough time acknowledging the fact that, you know, this is, I'm raising someone else's children. Um, the shift that took place within me was recognizing each of these kids as individuals and not a blood tie to that man. And when I was able to look at them that way and look at their needs and look at how fragile their, you know, how, how fragile they were when they were younger and the opportunity to be able to amplify their lives, it, it really, a lot of the growth had to come for me. They, they've kind of been constant, you know, it, it was, it was changes I had to do and how I viewed them. And it was, it was at a school play where it was probably a few years back. I, uh, we, we came in late and there was an aisle open center of the auditorium and I slid in there. And just as I was sitting down, I looked down the aisle and he was four seats from me. And my wife gave me an elbow. She's like, I can't believe you're sitting here. And I'm like, I can't believe I didn't see him. So I know, I know I would not have chosen that seat because, you know, I just don't like the guy. And as this performance went on, I was watching the kids um, do their thing up on stage. And I, I came in this moment of reflection, looking at Elliot, looking at how he dresses, how he presents himself, his interests, how Helena relates to me. Um, I just had this, this tremendous shift where I kind of had to kick myself and go, you know what? You've been kind of stupid all these years. You've looked at this situation as a competition and you never realized that you were winning this entire time. And it was extremely powerful to be able to recognize that even though I really didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know that I had kind of arrived as a dad and I was able to say, you know what, these are my kids. These are mine. This is my responsibility to make sure that they thrive. And it was it was very uplifting. And it took a lot of the anger away that I you know when I see this guy. I still don't care for him, but I'm recognizing, as you mentioned earlier, that he's probably a victim of his own circumstances as a child. He just hasn't found a way to shift out of it and better himself. So he's remained in this sedated place where he only knows how to feed himself emotionally and isn't able to show up and amplify their lives. So it also emphasized my role. So everything kind of tied together. It's like, okay, this guy doesn't have it. He can't bring it, but I can. And it was, it was an overwhelming moment to be able to say in my head, these are my kids. So mm -hmm. I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, it's thanks for sharing that because I actually got a bit of a, a revelation for myself about around that because in that, I think what you're also saying is not so much that you're, you're winning the war against him is that you've won the war for yourself. You know, it's Absolutely. like what I got out of that was, you know, because I've had that same sort of moment where you're just thinking, wow, like these are my kids and it's, it's not so much that they're your kids, it's, it's more, more so that you acknowledge that you're actually doing a good job and the job that you wanted to do in raising two amazing kids. And I think that, you know, that's a, it's a super powerful kind of thing to take away um, from that statement. So, yeah, thank you for that, you know, little bit of a gift for me today, which is, which is fantastic. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Look, um, Matt, I, I you know, I'll wrap this up shortly, but uh, I firstly just wanted to say 
huge thank you, huge appreciation for coming on and sharing and just being so open with us today. Um, it's been a great little discussion, and I, I, you know, you bring a totally different perspective with you being, you know, raised by step parents and then you know having step kids of your own and um, just hearing that whole progression and your own life and what you're taking from it is fantastic to pass on. Um, tell me, are there, is there any last kind of words or tips that you'd have for anyone out there that's you know, going through a similar situation to you? Um, you know, is there anything that you'd like to kind of finally give away as a, you know, as a stepdad piece of wisdom um, just to create some success for other stepdads? I think that it's critical to be able to identify that these are just small people that are fragile and that need a ton of love and support and guidance. And it, it doesn't matter where they've come from. If, if you have the opportunity to be that stepdad or that step parent, um, jump in with both feet, embrace the kids, give them what they need, um, form them to where they need to be formed and and just love them as individuals it was it was very challenging for me to get past that for a while i had i had some internal resentments um you know having to provide for someone else's kids was something that i would find myself saying sometimes in a, in a moment of anger and it was completely inappropriate for me to feel that way and you know i think that's probably the biggest message i could pass along is just look at them for who they are, not for where they came from, and, you know, give them all the love and support that they need. And it's 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 a mutually beneficial thing. And being able to give, you get so much in return, and it, it, it kind of completes the circle. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Um, again, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being so open. and. Mate, I look forward to, you know, obviously staying in touch and, and maybe possibly connecting again in the future and getting you back on maybe in a couple of years' time to see how everything's progressing. I would love to. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers, Matt. Thank you. Would you like to learn more about how stepdads across the globe are joining forces in raising the next generation of leaders? Then head to www.stepdadsuccess.com and grab all the show notes plus a copy of the brand new tactical guide for creating more happiness, health, wealth and wisdom as a stepdad. And if you liked the podcast, please share it with other stepdads you know and leave us a review on iTunes. Again, that's www.stepdadsuccess.com for all the show notes and tactical guide. Come and join the new breed of stepdads, the growing group of leaders raising leaders.